You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, Episode 79, Leviticus 17 and 18. I'm your layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Very good. Good to hear from you again, Trey. All right. Well, yeah, we're back here in Leviticus. So today we're going to cover 17, 18. And believe it or not, there's actually a pretty good amount uh, to cover here. So we're not going to go through everything as our format uh, is typical. We'll we'll float through the chapter and pull out this or that that I think people will find interesting. And there are a number of things I think people will find interesting in these two chapters. So just to situate them a little bit, Leviticus 17 through 26 is the section of the book that scholars uh, refer to as the holiness code. And Really, that's because these chapters, 17 through 26, focus on the people of Israel collectively uh, in terms of a collective or corporate responsibility to be holy. Uh, The idea is kind of expressed in Leviticus 19.2, where we read, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That, That phrase, again, speaking corporately, in context, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That phrase is actually really rare in the rest of Leviticus, and of course, beyond Leviticus, out in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. But here, in this section, 17 through 26, it is stated repeatedly uh, and really uh, emphatically in certain uh, certain sections. You have it in chapter 17, verse 1, 18, verse 1, 19, verse 2, 20, verse 2, 22, 17. Uh, again, it, it, it just gets repetition. And so scholars have noticed this. And again, based upon the content in these chapters, they have given it the name, the Holiness Code. Now, we're going to hit the first two chapters in the quote-unquote Holiness Code today. Chapter 17 is going to deal with uh, the proper forms of worship. Again, not really directed at the priesthood per se, uh, even though the, obviously the priesthood is going to be involved, but really sort of emphasizing the principles of sacrifice and and a few other things to the people corporately. In other words, this is your responsibility too. Whereas in Leviticus 16, it was all about the high priest. If the high priest does things correctly, God will accept the day of atonement ritual. Here, it's not about the high priest or even the priesthood per se. It's about everybody. Everybody has to do their part. And there are some things here that you know, he's going to track through in Leviticus 17 on into 18, of course, on through chapter 26, that all the people collectively need to pay attention to. Chapter 18, which we'll get into, are the laws about forbidden sexual unions. You have incest, adultery, homosexuality, etc. Things that are referred to with the Hebrew term to'eva, which is uh, detestable things or something abhorrent. Uh, In the context of Leviticus, it means behaviors that are inconsistent with holiness, because that's, again, the emphasis in this whole block. So jumping into chapter 17 here, the the first nine verses, we might as well just give that a quick read and then jump into some comments. The Lord said to the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, this is the thing the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. This is to the end of that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices, that they sacrifice in the open field, and they may bring them to the Lord, the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons. We mentioned this passage uh, last time in in Leviticus 16, uh, finishing the verse, no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. And you shall say to them, any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and does not bring it to to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. So that's the first nine verses. And, you know, the the flavor here, again, in part with verse seven is 
there's a concern here for stopping this idea of sacrificing to goat demons, uh, other other entities that were perceived to live out in the wilderness, you know, where the where the the goat for Azazel was driven. The Hebrew word is seirim. We need to we need to knock this off. We need to stop this. So there's there's this prohibitory sense in that narrow context, but more broadly, uh, you can see as as you read through this that there's a concern here about bringing sacrifices to the tent of meeting, because that is the place where God has commanded that sacrifices be brought. You can't just do this anywhere you want. Now, this passage has sort of an old problem associated with it, and that is going back to verse 3, if any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or kills it outside the camp, so on and so forth, you know, and doesn't bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, then that's bad. Well, kill there is the Hebrew term shakat. It is not the normal term for sacrifice, which is zavach. So the Hebrew verb shakat, which means to kill or to slaughter, can be used with one of two meanings in mind as it's used throughout the Hebrew Bible, including here in Leviticus. So the verb can mean to slaughter in a very general sense. And if that's what we're looking at here, then the verse would describe whenever an Israelite man just went out hunting and killed an animal, even if it's just for food, then that act of slaughter or the, the, or dressing the animal had to be carried out at the one legitimate location, the one legitimate altar located at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And you can see, well, that that would be kind of odd or inconvenient. Like, you mean, every time I go hunting, I gotta I gotta bring this thing to the to the the the, you know, the altar there at the tent of meeting, and you know, or else God's gonna be mad. Well, again, that that's looking at the term in its very general generic sense. The verb can also mean to sacrifice. In other words, that has a ritual tone to it. Uh, in other words, it could be a, a true synonym for zavak, again, to offer a sacrifice in a ritual sense. Again, if that's the way we read verse 3, then the sense would be that anything intended for ritual sacrifice had to be made, had to be brought to and and you know dealt with at the altar. But the general you know, slaughter of animals for food, like you're just going out hunting, that was okay because it's non-sacrificial. Now, the reason that the discussion is sort of important is because depending on how you take it, some have said it's contradictory to Deuteronomy 12, 15 and, and following, which I'll read for you here. It says, however, you may slaughter and eat meat within any of your towns. Now, right there, there's this permission to go out and hunt and eat meat within any of your towns. It doesn't have to be according to the central location, the, the tabernacle. It says, you may slaughter and eat meat within any of your towns as much as you desire according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. The cl- unclean and clean may eat out of it so as of the gazelle and as of the deer. Only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it out on the earth like water. You may not with you, you may not eat within your towns the tithe of your grain or the wine of your oil, blah, 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 blah. So right here in Deuteronomy 12, it, it sounds like there's permission given for just a broad hunting context, whereas if you're looking at Leviticus 17, you're not so sure. And so, again, scholars have pointed this out. Is there a contradiction between verses 3 and 4 in Leviticus 17? Because it's just all described as shakat, again, to kill. Is that a sacrifice or is it something broader? And whereas Deuteronomy 12 is a little more clear. So is there a contradiction here? Now, again, I think there's there's... You know, you might say, well, it looks like scholars are sort of making a mountain out of a molehill here. And, you know, and I can see that because it's clear in sacrificial texts, okay, of of the Torah, of the Pentateuch, that shakat, again, in in context where we're sure that that, the, that there's sacrificing going on, shakat never has the general sense of, of slaughtering non-ritually. Okay, that raises the question, well, what about other texts? You know, what about, again, contexts where you don't have this immediate, you know, sort of feel to them? I think, you know, what we have here is that since shakat is used both ways, depending on the different contexts, you know, in the, just broadly in the Torah, sometimes there's clearly a ritual sense going on, sometimes there's not. Since shakat can be used both ways, it is fair I think, and I'm not, I'm certainly not alone here, to interpret Leviticus 17 in light of Deuteronomy 12, that, that there's, there's no disagreement here because it, it, it specifies in verse 3, 
you know, ox, lamb, goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp. Okay. If it's intended for sacrifice, then yeah, you need to bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if it's not intended for sacrifice, and of course it doesn't wind up being a sacrifice, then you're okay if it's just a general killing for food like Deuteronomy 12 allows. So Again, I just want you to be aware that there's this issue because this is one of those things that sort of shows up classically in these, oh, here, look at all these errors in the Bible, you know, kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't have to be viewed that way because shakat has this elasticity. Sometimes it refers to ritual killing, other times it doesn't. Now, let's just say, though, for the sake of the discussion here, that somebody violates this legitimately. Like, like they, they do kill something outside the camp and they say, well, I was just hunting, but then they wind up bringing it for a sacrifice. Well, then, then there's a clear violation of what they're supposed to do. And the penalty is pretty severe. In verse 4, it says, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood. That man shall be cut off from among his people. Now, again, Blood guilt, this idea used elsewhere in the Pentateuch, is actually used for homicide elsewhere, you know, killing, killing an innocent human being. So we got, it's a dramatic term. You know, some, some scholars would say it, it's like hyperbole just to make the point that, hey, this is something really bad, really severe. It's, more, it's, it's a dramatic way of putting it. And I think that's the case here. But what I want to focus on is the penalty, this cutting off from among his people. Uh, the, the term there in Hebrew is karat. Okay, the verb, the lemma anyway. And where this term is used, it is basically used to describe a, a divine penalty. In other words, something God is going to do in response you know, to what has happened. Something God you know, has ordained or is actually sort of left to God to carry out. Now, there's a, there's a problem here too. So what what does cutting off from the people actually mean? And if if God is sort of the the behind the scenes actor in a lot of passages, how, how do we understand this? Now a lot of modern scholars would look at karat and define it as uh, either excommunication, in other words, the person is driven away from the compute from the community. So, so the effect is, look, we're we're cutting you off from the whole community, and we're going to let God deal with you, live or die. That's up to God. You're, you're you're just out of the community. Goodbye. Some though would say, well, it, it maybe it's the death penalty. In other words, God authorizes you know other people to put this person to death. So either excommunication or again a death penalty sort of situation. It really sort of depends in many cases on the passage, but there again that 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 creates the problem of well, it might be clear in one place, but what about where it's there's ambiguity? You know, how should we parse this? Uh, again, this is a very general reference here in Leviticus. Now, a lot of Leviticus scholars, people like Milgram and Levine, they kind of lean away from karat being an immediate death penalty. Uh, carried out by people, and uh, they a lot of them follow the rabbis in this. Those who you know, would, would take this view, point out that, look, all the offenses where karat is prescribed, coincidentally, they would say not coincidentally, are deliberate sins against God and not fellow humans. And so in, in, in the priestly literature, like Leviticus here and other places, again, sins against God, the, the, the idea is are punishable by God and not necessarily by man. So it follows that karat is something that is left up to God to decide. So that argues in favor of excommunication, sort of leaving this person's destiny up to God. Now, Milgram actually lists these uh, in, in his commentary. There are 19 cases of karat in the Torah, and he has them submitted you know, under some, some categories. I'll just briefly go through these. There's violations of sacred time or calendar, things like neglecting the Passover, it's Numbers 9, 13, uh, eating leaven uh, during you know, a, a particular festival, Exodus 12, working on the Sabbath, Exodus 31, working on Yom Kippur, Leviticus 23. Again, that's one category. Another category is mishandling a sacred substance, either blood or part of the sacrifice typically that was to be given over to God. So consuming blood here in Leviticus 17.10, that's going to be condemned with karat. Eating parts of the, of the sacrifice that you shouldn't, again, in Leviticus 7, that's karat. Uh, eating a sacrifice while you're impure, Leviticus 7 again, karat. I mean, you, you, you get the impression, again, the, these, are, these are offenses or violations that in some way 
transgress the worship of God and, and what is God's and how God wants to be worshipped. And so therefore the logic is that the, the penalty is is up to God. And so karat would be drive that person out of the community. And of course, they're, they're never going to be allowed back. Uh, you have the same thing in third category, purification rituals. Uh, another category Milgram lists is illicit worship. For instance, the worship of Molech or other forms of idolatry, the punishment is karat. Consulting the dead, necromancy, karat. Those are both in Leviticus 20. The one odd one, the, you know, the 19th instance that Milgram lists that you'll find kind of interesting because we're going to get into this in Leviticus 18 is illicit sexual relationships. Now you'd say, well, how, why does that belong with all these other, all these other ones? It's very clear that what you're doing is violating the way God wants to be worshiped. Again, the, the, the rules that he's given or, or maybe, you know, stealing some offering from him that belongs to God. And there's some sort of personal violation between the offender and God himself. Why in the world would would some of these sexual relationships be listed? Uh, and specifically, Leviticus 18, again, we'll, we'll get into them in a moment, are, are described, and then the, the punishment, you know, cut that person off, you know, the karat is, is actually given. Now, I my impression, I'll say this now, and then we'll we'll pick it up when we get to Leviticus 18. I think it's possible that the reason these sorts of things are listed among these other worship ritual oriented things is because certain sexual activities and prohibitions, uh, certain sexual acts were thought to, and they're they're actually said to quote, pollute the land. And since the land actually belongs to God, those are interpreted as offenses directly against God. They result in defiling something God owns permanently uh, because there's, there's no system of atonement for the land when it's defiled. I mean, the, the, the Old Testament, we, we mentioned this way, way, way back when we were introducing Leviticus, that some forms of impurity are ritual, others are, are more serious. The ritual ones have a cure. You know, you do this for a certain number of days and you wait and then you're going to be then you're going to be pure again. You bring a sacrifice, you're all taken care of. But there are other uh, violations that were that went beyond ritual impurity. They were moral impurities, and they had no solution except for God to essentially wipe the slate clean and start over. And that's actually what you see described in, um, like, in Leviticus 23, where you know God says, "Hey, if you do all these terrible things and you pollute the land and so on and so forth, then I'm gonna I'm gonna cast you out. I'm gonna kick you out of the land. I'm gonna exile you. You're gonna die in somebody else's country." And 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 I'm just essentially going to wipe the land clean of you, and then it it will sit fallow, you know, for a while, and and that's the cure, a complete reset by God. And so, since a lot of these things are in that that category in some of these other chapters, I think that's the logic here. That that again, some of these sexual relationships were viewed as so defiling. Uh, of the land itself. And the land belongs to God. That's why they're listed here among all these other offenses that are sort of personally against Yahweh himself. But we'll return to Leviticus 18 in a moment. So let's go back to Karat. Again, how do we, how do we parse this? How do we understand it? So in addition, okay, this is, this is going to sound either weird or kind of interesting. In addition to this, okay, is it excommunication or death penalty? I, I think that you can make a good argument that you know, it is excommunication because there are, there are lots of places where karat is described that, that you know, don't wind up involving a, a death penalty, you know, being executed. And karat is still used. It's, a, it's, a, it's an uneven list. Okay, let, let's just be honest. But there are enough of them that it, that seems to be uh, going too far if you just say it's a death penalty sort of on the spot. It, it may just be that they are kicked out and we let God deal with them. So I think there's something to that. But along with that, you have, you have some other factors going on here because in some passages where karat is referred to, you actually get two other ideas, either one or two or you know, one or both in the passage that are kind of interesting. One is what scholars would call extirpation. That is the offender's line, his bloodline is terminated. In other words, he may not himself be put to death. But there's some sort of cursing language where God will cause his ancestry, his descendants, his name to just die out. Uh, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of these in a, in a second here. So not only is the person put out of the community, but essentially you leave you know, God deal with him. And the way God's going to deal with him is, is you're not going to have an ancestry. Okay? 
your name is going to end. And that, to an ancient person, was a serious thing because that's how you're remembered. They, 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 they tied that up with, uh, you know, sort of the afterlife thinking. And that brings us to the second part of this. Not only is there extirpation where the offender's bloodline is terminated, but there are a couple passages that actually imply, and I get this, denial of afterlife with that person's own family members that have died and gone on before. Uh, so there's a loss of ancestry there in, in the sense of my, my own descendants. And not only that, but but God is saying, I'm going to cut you off in the afterlife from those who have gone before you, those loved ones. You, you will never be reunited with them. God forbids reunion with the extended family. Now, let me just give you a few examples here. Uh, you have in Psalm 109:13, we have the, the, we read as follows: May his posterity, again the, the the offender here, be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. Now, in the context to this, you know who's who's the person you know doing this bad stuff? Well, there's a whole list of things in Psalm 109. Uh, again, bad things that lead to may his posterity karat. Again, be cut off. It's the same word used in Leviticus. And so scholars have looked at this passage and thought, okay, Karat, well, maybe, maybe that's part of the punishment back in Leviticus where you drive a person away and they're left destitute or, or God will deal with them harshly. And so that person's bloodline is going to be cut off. And the second part of Psalm 109, may his name be blotted out in the second generation. Basically, you're just consigned to be forgotten. Uh, is is kind of the extended significance of karat there. If we if we look at Psalm 109:13 and factor that in to what's going on in Leviticus, there's another one in Ruth 4:10. We get this reading: Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought. This is Boaz speaking. I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off there's Karat, from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place, you are my witnesses this day. So this is the Boaz, the climax of the story where he redeems Ruth. Now, the point is that it was part of the role of the lever in leveret marriage, in this case, Boaz, to perpetuate the line and the name of the deceased husband. So if that's part of, again, the the worldview thinking, again, that if, if you don't have, if you don't have descendants, that that is going to result in you essentially being forgotten forever. And and that is defined or articulated with the term karat. Then again, maybe this is a concept we can look back in Leviticus and, you know, where, where karat is mentioned again for these 19 things here in Leviticus. Maybe that is part of what karat meant back in Leviticus when God is talking about you shall cut this person off you know from the from his people or something like that third one and this one's really you know, sort of the same kind of thing Malachi 2:12 says may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob again karat may the Lord karat from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this who brings an offering uh, to the Lord of hosts. Now, again, there's a specific crime, you know, going back, you know, into Malachi 12, the profaning of the covenant, again, committing abominations. And some of these abominations in Malachi 2.11, to eva, they're the same things listed in Leviticus chapter 17 and other places in Leviticus. It's the same term, detestable things. So this is, is actually more of a, of a direct link back to Leviticus, because now we also have To'eva uh, in Malachi 2, 11 and 12 that talks about descendants being cut off, someone's, someone's lineage being cut off. And of course, we can factor in these other verses that ultimately what that means is that you're going to be forgotten forever. We can show you one more, Leviticus 20, uh, verses 2 and 3. Again, this is this is kind of an interesting or curious passage. Uh, let's just go back to verse one. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, here we are in verse two, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. Now you would read that and you'd think just on the surface, well, that's obviously the death penalty. And and it is. But why, after God says, put that person to death, God also says, I'm going to cut that man off from among his people. 
you say, well, it, it, it all means the same thing. It's just repeating the same thought. Well, maybe. But what it also could mean, you know, again, in light of the Old Testament language about when, when people are dying, they say things like, I'm going to go be with my fathers. I'm going to go be with my descendants, um, people. It's this idea that, okay, I'm going to die now, but I'll be, I'll be united, reunited with my loved ones who've gone on before me, that sort of idea. So you could read Leviticus 20 as, as actually involving both. In other words, God is so offended at the child sacrifice to Molech that he says, not only is, is this guy, whoever does this, not only are they going to be put to death sort of on the spot, but I am going to divorce him from <laughs> his departed ancestors that he probably hopes he would be reunited with in the afterlife. Forget that. He, he's, just, he's just gone. Uh, so he's even denied any sort of afterlife hope or wish. So it, it transcends committing an offense worthy of death in this life to now, you know, they're, you know now you're even barred from any sort of afterlife hope. Uh, it, just, it sort of ups the ante. Uh, in Leviticus 20. So in, in this text, you, you might actually have two things going on. Death plus the karat uh, awaits this this criminal that, that does this particular crime in you know, offering a child to Molech. Again, this is, these are passages that scholars look at to try to figure out what karat might entail. So I think the fairest thing you can say is that it, it might have a death penalty connotation in certain passages, but in others, it's not that specific. And it might actually involve, again, being driven out of the community. So, again, you're, you're left for God to deal with. And even worse than that, it might even be a sort of an afterlife prohibition uh, because of what you've done. So karat was a, a really, really serious thing. And all of these offenses, again, were sort of like personal crimes uh, against God himself. Even, even the, the sexual deviancy stuff, again, because that was thought to pollute the land, that was interpreted as a, an offense personally to God because God owns the land. You've ruined it now and it's God's property. That's sort of, you know, that, that, that's the thinking process that would go, go on through that. Now in verses 10 to 12, we'll go back to Leviticus 17 here. These verses describe the, you know, either proper or improper handling of sacrificial blood. Uh, and it, of course, it also includes a prohibition against consuming blood. So you, this is where we get this, this notion of, he says, uh, if any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will karat, you know, cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither any stranger who sojourns among you shall eat blood. So this is sort of a big deal. Consuming blood, in effect, is stealing it from God because the blood was supposed to be, you know, put out on the altar, splashed on the altar. And this is, again, denoting that, you know, just like the, the, the sacrificial portions of the animal that went on the altar and were burned and, and all that, that was God's part. Well, so was the blood. So if you consumed any of this, you were eating from God's plate, so to speak. You were stealing from God. And this, this was, again, viewed as a personal violation, a, a karat offense uh, that you would be put out of the community or perhaps even worse, depending on what God decides to do with you. And in, in fact, in, in, in these verses, I don't know if you picked up on it, but you have a, you know, God says very directly, I shall cut off. You know, in other words, here we go again with this idea that we're going to, this person has done something bad and we're going to let God personally deal with this person. You'll notice in this passage, verses 10 through 12, it doesn't say that person gets put to death and then I'm going to cut him off from his ancestors. You know, it doesn't say that like it did in Leviticus 20. Here, what you have going is that we have an offender and God says, I will take care of this guy. I will cut him off. I will do whatever needs to be done. Again, the, the penalty is left to God, that idea. And we just like we talked about a few minutes ago with karat, that's a big part of, of what that term meant for the ancient Israelite. Now about this, this line about the life of the flesh is in the blood. This gets repeated in verse 14. Again, you have similar statements elsewhere in the Torah. Deuteronomy 12, 23 uh, says, for the, the blood is the life. You must not consume the life with the flesh. Again, just Put yourself in, a, in an ancient Israelite's shoes. It, th these verses are not saying there's anything mystical about blood. Oh, they, they knew like blood science. They knew about hemoglobin and 
genetics and, you know, all this sort of stuff that you can detect with DNA analysis. It's not saying that at all. Just look at, look at the, at what's being said. You have a body and for your body to be alive, it needs blood. So somehow, again, in their understanding, and you know, obviously we, we would agree with this, even in our modern scientific context, if your body loses enough blood, you are going to die. Okay, they could experience that. They could see that. They could see the effect of losing blood leading to death. So that, in that sense, hey, there's something about the blood, again, in their, in their own you know, ancient worldview. There's something about this liquid that flows in our bodies. It's not like sweat. It's not like spit. It's not even like semen. There's something different about this substance that we have to have this in our bodies or else we are going to die. So the, the conception was that there's life here. This is what keeps your body alive. It's what gives it life, keeps your body alive. This is the fluid God has given you for this purpose. So blood represents life. And therefore, in a sacrificial system, it can protect a human who violates God's laws or violates sacred space by means of substitutively purging that person from their impurity you know, from, from the violation. So Levine, I have a little quote from Levine here. He says, basic to the theory of sacrifice in ancient Israel, as in many other ancient societies, was the notion of substitution. The sacrifice substituted for an individual human life or for the lives of the members of the community in situations where God could have exacted the life of the offender or anyone else for that matter. Indeed, all who stood in God's immediate presence risked becoming the object of divine wrath. And we've seen this before. That's the end of the quote. I mean, we, we've seen this before in other things we've looked at in Leviticus. So what sacrifice meant conceptually was that God will accept the blood of another life, in this case, an animal, on behalf of the blood that he could exact from you. Okay. It's in lieu of your life that God will accept this other life. So I, I think this is just an important observation. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but if any of you out there who are listening to this have done any reading on sort of how modern scholarship, even within evangelicalism, views the atonement, the atonement of Christ, it amazes me how how so many scholars and people try to rid the theology of atonement from substitution. Substitutionary atonement somehow has become offensive uh, in our culture, probably, again, because it involves blood. And so we have different views of the atonement. There's the ransom theory, there's the good good guy theory, good life theory, example theory. Look, I'm not saying that the atonement doesn't include some of these other aspects. What I am saying is that you... W- you do not understand atonement, and no Israelite would have thought about atonement the way you're thinking about it if you divorce substitution from it. That is intrinsic to the whole idea. And as, again, these, these blood sacrifices are in some way typological of what Jesus did, if you are stripping out the principle of substitutionary atonement totally from the atonement picture, you're not understanding it the way an ancient Israelite would have understood it. Because th- that would have been the first thing that an ancient Israelite thought of with the concept of purging someone from their impurity. I- I'm in trouble. I am in, I am in heap big trouble because I have violated sacred space and God could demand my life. But God has said, I won't do that if you bring a substitute life in your place, you know, this, this list of animals or whatever. That, that is intrinsic to the whole idea. It's not the only thing that atonement is about, but it is, it is certainly an important part. And for modern thinkers, quote unquote, uh, modern, you know, people who are just offended by the idea, trying to redefine the atonement in, in terms of trying to define substitution out of the concept, that is foreign to biblical thinking. It just is uh, that no no Israelite would have ever looked at it the way you're looking at it if that's where you're at. Verses 13 to 15, one thing here that's kind of interesting. This, I'll just read it to you. Anyone, anyone else of the people of Israel or the strangers who sojourn among them, who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten, uh, shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth, with earth. For the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, you should not eat the blood of any creature for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So you know, again, just don't, don't consume blood. And then it, here in verse 15, and every person who eats what dies of itself, like let's say they come across a dead animal out there in the field, or that which was torn by beasts. They come across a mauled animal or something, something that was attacked. Every person who, you know, who encounters this or who eats from one of these 
cases, one of these animals in these cases, whether he's native or a sojourner, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening, then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his flesh, he shall bear his iniquity. In other words, this is going to put you in a state of uncleanness. Again, pretty clear, but there's this odd phrase here about, again, even if you're out, you know, and, and you're, you're hunting or whatever, and you kill an animal, and, and, and it's okay if it's not a sacrifice, you know, to, to kill it for food, whatever, you have to drain the blood, the life, or the, the, the blood of the animal is supposed to be poured out on the earth, or, you know, just pour it out on the ground, verse 13, and then cover the blood with dirt, cover the blood with earth. Now, commentators have looked at this and, and thought, you know, what, why, why? I mean, what, what's up with that? Now, there are a number of of theories. Milgram lists a couple, and he tells you, you know, again, which ones he thinks are crazy, which ones he thinks are worth thinking about. And there's two that he lists that I'm going to give here because I think they – I don't think they're mutually exclusive, and I think they both sort of work together and they make sense. One idea is that you cover the blood of this animal you've killed out in the field with dirt so that, again, conceptually, the blood would be returned to God. So in other words, God allowed you, you know, the the life of this animal, you know, because you need food and that sort of thing. So God gave this creature life so that, you know, you could someday, you know, kill it, need it to sustain your own life. And part of you recognizing that is pouring the blood out on the ground, dressing it, draining the blood there, and then covering it with dirt so that it goes back uh, to God. Again, this is sort of honorific act, you know, to, to honor you know, this animal and of course God giving it to you. So that, I think, I think there's, there's something there again, that, that makes sense just again in, in conceptually in the way they looked at things and, and the way, you know, Genesis describes things about things, you know, being, you know, for the, the sustenance of human life and whatnot. Again, that, that makes sense. It's workable. Again, it's sort of a commemorative act there to help remind you the, Hey, this is why you even have food. Life is from God. You, and here you, you know, it comes from the ground you know, the dust of the ground, you know, kind of thing. And that the, you know, the earth yielded these things for you at God's behest. This is the way God has designed things. So now you cover it with dirt and and don't consume it. It goes back to God. The second idea is that so that the blood would never be used in ritual, okay, divinatory rites, what scholars would call chthonic rites. Chthonic is, is a term that refers to dealing with earth substances uh, that, that for, again, divinatory purposes. So again, we don't want the blood to be used for any sort of ritual divinatory acts. And so you cover it with dirt. In other words, you, you pollute the blood so that it can't be used in divination. You, know, you, you make it dirty. Okay. It's, it's not pure, quote unquote. Now, I, I think, again, that idea is worthy of consideration too, because if anyone in an ancient culture, either in Israel or somebody else who's out there you know, in, in some other place where they happen to be hunting, to discourage this blood being used or, quote, given to or given back to a foreign deity. To discourage that, we cover it with dirt. Again, I think there's there's something to that. And I don't think these ideas are mutually exclusive. The, the ban, again, on using blood in ritual or divinatory acts implies that blood, because blood is life, and because only Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the life giver, and no other deity can legitimately claim to be the life giver, blood, which is life, should only go back to God. It should only go back to its maker. Either in sacrifice, you splash the blood on the altar. If here in this context, we cover it with dirt so that no other deity can receive it, and no other, it can be used for, for the contact of or worship of any other deity. So I think that is is a coherent way to look at what seems, again, to be sort of an odd command here. But again, they, they believe in an animate supernatural world that intersects with our world. And so this is something because it's given by the life giver. It has life. It's valuable. It should be given back only to the maker and no one else, no other deity. It, it, it actually becomes sort of a worship, again, a, a thing to honor God by doing this. And I think that's why it's here in Leviticus. Well, let's jump into Leviticus 18 for a little bit. Leviticus 18, if you've ever read this, this isn't going to surprise you, but this is the most complete collection uh, of uh, sexual laws, you know, again, prohibited sexual relationships within the Torah. Again, there's a lot of them in there. We're, we're not going to parse every one of them because, frankly, a lot of them are pretty self-explanatory. But I think, you know, some of the logic here needs to be pointed out. Why Why do you have forbidden sexual relationships at all? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One was it had the effect of sort of delimiting or you know building the boundaries of what was conceived of as the immediate family 
the family unit versus the extended family, you know, people that would, would sort of become part of your family through marriage. Well, that was different than family members that were, were close relatives. In other words, your own kids, okay, that kind of thing, the, the, the ones that you brought in, into being, and so on and so forth. So these laws have the effect of defining what the immediate family, what constitutes the immediate family, that is, sexual relationships are forbidden within immediate family members or among immediate family members outside the husband, the man, and his wife or wives, okay? Uh, and again, you can't, it's part of the logic why you don't take someone else's wife, you don't commit adultery, you don't take someone else's wife and, and make them your own because they, again, that, that you're violating a family, an immediate you know, family boundary there. Now, outside, again, the man and his wife or wives and their children, outside of, again, those sorts of boundaries, you could marry within the extended family members, what, what the Bible, what the Old Testament patriarchal culture would refer to as the mishpacha, the clan, okay? In fact, those marriages were actually encouraged because they, again, magnified or grew the extended family and they created more immediate families within the context of the greater clan. So the sexual laws have, have a way of defining you know, which group is which and what are the boundaries between the groups, that sort of thing. So Levine says here, uh, for instance, quote, the immediate family was formed by a man who married one or more wives, thereby initiating the process of procreation. This conception of the family explains why the regulations governing sexual behavior were addressed to the male. Again, there's always male language in these Leviticus passages. They're addressed to the male as the head of the family rather than somebody else because the male had more sort of immediate control uh, over the situation, again, respecting these boundaries. Now, let's talk a little bit about a, a couple of these things. Again, I'm not going to read through the whole chapter. You could, you could do that again about uncovering the nakedness of XYZ. There's a whole listing of these. Let's talk about a couple. Let's talk about incest. Now, Levine, again, I think has a nice handy way of, of parsing this and describing this. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote him again, then just sort of branch off from this. Levine writes, two principles govern the definition of incest in the code of chapter 18 and through the rest of the Torah. Because, you know, let me just stop here. You, you get this question all the time. Well, isn't marrying like your second cousin, isn't that incest? Well, you know, it, it might be incest by, by our cultural boundaries. But again, within the patriarchal culture of the Old Testament, these chapters describe what is the immediate family and what is not. So again, back to Levine here. So there's two principles that govern what is incest and what isn't within the Torah. Number one, she'er, that's the Hebrew term uh, for flesh relations in, uh, in Levine's parlance here. She'er, which sometimes is known as consanguinal or blood relations. And number two, Erva, which is the word for nakedness. This is a euphemism for sexuality. Again, continuing with Levine, the nuclear family was founded on six She'er relatives, mother, father, son, daughter, brother, and sister. That was the immediate family. We learn this indirectly from the code of purity governing the Israelite priesthood. According to Leviticus 21, 2, and 3, an ordinary priest usually forbidden to devile himself through conduct with a corpse was, nevertheless, permitted to attend the burial of any one of these six relatives. Again, the, this is the near family. Levine continues, the She'er relationship is extended in 18, 12 to 13 from Leviticus 21 to include the sister of one's father or mother. The She'er relatives are in a different category from the members of the family related by affinity, those who become a man's relatives by marriage. The basic principle regulating sexual union with affinity relatives is conveyed by the term erva, nakedness. The only exception is leveret marriage, which according to Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10, is something you do if, again, the you know, you have a situation where a woman's husband has died and there's no, you know, no one, you know, really, you know, to take you know, their, their place. Again, the, the concern was to keep the man's name alive and his descendants and his heritage, his property, all that stuff. And so the leveret system was there to, to take care of that. Levin says that's, that's really the only exception here. So you have, again, to summarize what Levin is saying, you have she'er relationships, mother, father, son, daughter, brother, sister, and then non she'er relationships. And the prohibition against having sexual relationships with those that are near to you, again, is expressed with 
phrases like uncovering someone's nakedness. Again, that was that's just the, the idiomatic way of expressing it. But there's a certain logic to both groups. Now, two notes here that I think are really worth pointing out because I think you know, listeners will find them interesting. If you look at the language here in Leviticus 18, where you have the phrase uncovering the nakedness of all over the place, you have it through the chapter. If you look at the the instances where the passage talks about uncovering the nakedness of one's father or uncovering the nakedness of one's uncle. And of course, that would mean having sex with you know your father's wife or your uncle's wife. In other words, it's beyond voyeurism. You're, this is the idiomatic expression of, you know, to have sexual relationships with your mom, you know, your father's wife or your uncle, you know, uncle's wife. If you take that now think about the term uncovering the nakedness, okay? That idiomatic expression, the verb there, uncovering. If you go to Leviticus 20, here's what you read. If a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother, and sees her nakedness. Now it's not uncovering nakedness, it's seeing nakedness. And she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness and he shall bear his iniquity. Now you see what that verse does. That verse equates seeing someone's nakedness and uncovering someone's nakedness. They're synonymous idiomatic expressions in that passage. And you say, well, who cares? Why, why point this out? Well, I would suggest that you take this back to Genesis 9. You know, the sin of Ham Ham, you know, and Noah, and, and Ham commits this heinous crime, but Ham isn't the one punished. Canaan is. His son is punished. And people have wondered for generations, what in the world's going on with that? You know, well, how does this make any sense? You know, now, again, I could, here, here we go again. I could post a, a, an article to this uh, on this, you know, on the blog. And, I, and now since, since I brought it up, I'll do that. But I would suggest to you that you read this article. I, th- I think it presents a compelling case that What Ham does is not just merely looking at his father's naked body, at Noah's naked body. It's also not having incestual sex with Noah. In other words, homosexual incest with his father, violating his father that way. But he sees the nakedness of his father. And what that means in Leviticus language is that he has maternal incestual relationships. He has sex with his mom. And the reason Canaan is punished is because Canaan is the product of that union. Again, that that might kind of blow your minds right now, but that's why I'll post the article. It it it's quite compelling. It explains the logic of of what not only Ham does, why Canaan is cursed instead of Ham. Canaan is cursed because when Ham does this, when you take the leader's wife or wives, think of David, think of Absalom, okay? When you do this, you're asserting that you are now taking control of the tribe. You are taking control of, again, what belongs to the patriarch. You are usurping that position for your own. So this was a move on the part of Ham to take control of the family after the flood, to take control away from Noah. So he violates his mother. He takes his his dad's wife, you know, his, his woman, and says, I am the leader now. He tells his brothers and the brothers, so they, they can distance themselves from the whole thing. They go in and they even go backward. They, they go in and they, un- they, they cover their father's nakedness. In other words, they cover their mom, okay, to, to make it clear that they have no participation. They oppose what's going on here. And then when Noah discovers what has happened, he curses, not Ham, he curses Canaan. Basically, he's cutting off with a curse. Ham's line that Ham would have thought, this is, now I'm building my own dynasty here. This is my child by my mom's womb. Noah curses it and says, we're going to put a stop to that right now. So again, read the article, but I I wanted to mention it here because the language here in Leviticus 18, along with Leviticus 20, contributes, I think, to understanding what's going on in Genesis 9. Again, that was a bit of a rabbit trail, but I think it's interesting. Second thing to bring up here is why in Leviticus 18, let's go down to, uh, oh, let's see, verse 19. Uh, you shall not, appro- you know, here we are 
smack dab in this list of who not to have sex with and why and when. It says, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she's in her menstrual uncleanness. Again, because you're going to be infected, you'll be ritually impure. Okay, verse 20. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. And not only would you be impure, but you know, that's also adultery because she's married to another man. Verse 21. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of of your God. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination and you shall not lie with any animal so that you make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Now, here's the question. Why is homosexuality not grouped with the preceding list of sexual relations that were prohibited? Why is it instead grouped with the abominations of child sacrifice and bestiality. Again, because the, they just seem so much worse than the stuff that has preceded. Why is homosexuality grouped in, you know, in that bunch? Well, you know, a little bit of background here. And again, I'm not going to go off too far on a, a lecture on homosexuality and ancient attitudes toward it. Other cultures, um, this, and this is Israel, Israel is an exception here across the board, but other cultures allowed homosexual sex. In other words, it wasn't severely punished, even though it was generally looked down upon. It, it really depended on the context because a man, for instance, could rape another man to degrade them, uh, to bring them into submission or to establish like with, with the Greek uh, pederasty system to establish sort of a, you know, an, an order of authority and submission uh, with their their younger male charges that they were training to be warriors, you know that that kind of thing. It was just something that they all you you all had this done to you until you sort of grew up, and now you were the aggressor. You were the one that was going to again teach in in this again to to what sounds to my ear like a very perverse way of teaching. You're going to teach you know submission, uh, male authority. Uh, the pecking order, so to speak, in this culture through this act. This is, again, I'm just using the Greeks for an example. This didn't happen, you know, across the board in ancient cultures, but that's, that's sort of a handy example. That sort of activity was not looked down upon in certain cultures because it was just, again, part of this is how you teach authority, okay? You you humble you know these other these other young young boys these young men and this is part of their training again to be warriors okay so that that wasn't something you'd punish it, it was one of the contexts that in ancient cultures allow for this now Israel never allows for for again the, the homosexual act in any of these contexts at all so Israel's kind of unique in this regard and and commentators again are very familiar with this it was homosexual uh, sex though was looked poorly upon it was derided when in, in the cases of the male who was in the submissive role, in other words, the male who was penetrated or, or violated, and not so much the penetrator because that was the aggressor that you know he was you know again establishing power, so males were just generally not supposed to play the submissive role of women, and so when you had that situation, then broadly speaking in in ancient culture, homosexuality was looked down upon in that setting, so it could be looked down on some setting and, then, and not looked down on in others. It just depended on the context. Now, lesbianism never really gets the same attention, especially in the ancient Near East, doesn't get much attention at all. And I think, now this is just me talking, I'm going to explain this in, in a moment. I think it's likely because, this is going to sound really odd, because no children were lost or killed, in quotation marks. You say, well, what what the heck are you talking about? I mean, what what in the world's going on with that? Children killed through homosexuality? That doesn't make any sense at all. That's just that's just terrible to say. Well, again, we're not speaking literally, or we're not, and we're not speaking again the, the language of of the way a modern person would think about sex. Just hold that thought. I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. What what I mean by that? I'm going to have a quote here from Milgram that I think, again, helps. And then we'll, we'll return to some of my own personal thoughts about why why homosexuality gets, gets lumped in with these other uh, offenses. But Milgram says, the difference between biblical legislation and other Near Eastern laws must not be overlooked. The Bible allows for no exceptions. All acts of sodomy are prohibited, whether performed by rich or poor, high or low status, citizen or alien. So it has these cultural allowances, this is me talking now, these cultural allowances that you're going to see in other parts of the ancient world, they did not apply in ancient Israel. 
Back to Milgram. He says, many theories have been propounded to provide a rationale for this prohibition, again, this across-the-board prohibition. One must surely exist since this absolute ban on homosexual intercourse is unique, not only in the Bible, but uh, as shown in Olyan's study, to the entire ancient Near Eastern classical world. Again, Israel is the exception. To be sure, Milgram again, a rationale is given with staccato emphasis, the pollution of the land in the concluding exhortation, again, in these chapters of Leviticus. But that does not explain the individual prohibitions in the list. Okay. Now, dropping down a little bit in the quotation here, some of the explanations that have been offered, again, the connection with idolatry, maybe that's the reason. Milgram also includes the blurring of or the blurring of boundaries, again, between the genders, maybe that's an explanation. Wasting of male seed, semen, maybe that's an explanation. The mixing of semen with other defiling liquids, again, in homosexual intercourse, on the grounds that they don't share sort of the same properties, or or, one represents life and, and excrement would represent death. Maybe that's going on in the ancient mind. Maybe that's the reason for a total prohibition. Again, he just goes through a number of these options. And then he says this, the common denominator of all the prohibitions I submit, this is Milgram, is that they involve the emission of semen for the purpose of copulation, resulting in either incest and illicit progeny, or as in this case, lack of progeny again, homosexual relationships, or the destruction of progeny in the case of Molech worship. In a word, the theme is procreation. This rationale fully complements and presupposes in the laws of Leviticus 15, 16, and 18. Semen emission per se is not forbidden. It just defiles, again, ritually. But purificatory rites can follow. But in certain cases of sexual congress, it is strictly forbidden and severe consequences must follow, end of quote. Now, here's why, again, with that as a backdrop and what I've said earlier, here's why I think, this is just me talking now, why I think homosexuality, instead of being listed in in the, the forefront of Leviticus 18, gets lumped in with offering your children to Molech and bestiality and, and that sort of thing. I think the, the logic, the rationale is this. Homosexuality and bestiality were, A, contrary to creation order, That is, you're copulating with someone or something else where procreation could not be the result. In other words, it couldn't produce children. So therefore, it's contrary to creation order. And B, killing children was also contrary to procreation. So what I'm getting at here is the the pre-scientific idea that the child was resident in the man, in, in their semen, the seed, the child was was deposited by the man into the womb of a woman and there it would grow and it would it would you know grow into life and then it would be born it's procreation that is impossible in homosexuality and so homosexuality gets viewed as causing the loss of life because you're you're having semen emitted that cannot produce life. It is prohibited from producing life. Again, because the, the view is that the man is depositing a child in the woman's womb so it can grow. And and if if that sexual act is in a context of copulation where that child cannot I hate to use the planting metaphor, take root and grow. Again, I'm, these, these are an, these ancient concepts, then you're essentially killing it. Because the end of that child is going to be death, because it's not in the womb of a woman. You can't have it in the womb of an animal, okay, or again, inside another man. And that is the inherent logic to this wholesale, again, prohibition. So what you have here is, again, homosexuality is looked upon uh, negatively for two reasons, again, in, in, in the Torah, Again, it's contrary to creation order because uh, creation, the the sexual act, is ultimately designed for procreation. That's not to say that you're never supposed to have sex. You know, biblical people thought you couldn't have sex for pleasure, okay? I mean, there is the Song of Solomon. There is, you know, Paul's talk in 1 Corinthians 7 about orienting sexual behavior with with pleasure in in the context of marriage, okay? We get that. We're we're going back here to to the ultimate purpose of copulation, and that was producing children, okay? So if if you're if you're doing it in a context where you can't produce children, that is contrary to creation order. And secondly, it ends up, in the case of bestiality and homosexuality, it ends up terminating the life of the child that was thought to be deposited in the womb. It, it's like killing. It's like murder. That's why it gets grouped where it groups. Now, 
I also think this is why lesbian relationships get no attention. Again, because in a lesbian relationship, you don't have the loss of life because there's no semen involved. And so that, again, is something that just... It wasn't a concern. Now, you know, Paul later on is going to you know talk about lesbian relationships. But here in the Old Testament, in the context of, again, delineating what the immediate family is and what the extended family is and why you have an immediate family and why you shouldn't, you know, have sexual relations within the immediate family. The immediate family is to create children with your wife and nobody else. You know, the extended family, you know, that's something different. You can marry into the clan. All that stuff is about procreation and copulation. So it has nothing to do with, with lesbian relationships because it's just not a question. You know, semen is not in the picture. And so I think that's why lesbian relationships in the Torah just doesn't, don't get any attention at all. Now, later on, Paul, uh, well, I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, in those two elements are the biblical rationale behind condemning homosexuality. Now, in today's scientific con- context, the second one doesn't work because we know that children, whole persons, are not in the male, in the sperm. Okay, we know that. We know where babies come from. You know, we know what, what genetics is all. We know, we, we know all this. So the second part of the rationale goes by the wayside. It, it doesn't work. The first one, though, is still intact, and that is this is contrary to creation order. And that is actually the basis of what Paul says in Romans 1. You know, Paul doesn't talk about, he doesn't link this with killing and kids dying, and he doesn't do any of that, right? So what Paul's tracking on in that chapter, and what, again, becomes the theological rationale uh, in the New Testament for opposing homosexuality, and also to be consistent with with the Old Testament, but at the core of it, Paul's argument, and he includes both types of homosexual relationship, which is which is significant. He includes men with men, women with women, doing that which is unnatural. His argument is that doing this is contrary to creation order. You are not do, you're not exercising this gift of God for the reason that God wanted you to have it, the reason why He gave it to you. So this is contrary to God's design. That is at the heart of the New Testament thinking about homosexuality. Whereas in the Old Testament, this other aspect becomes a little more clear, even though it's odd to us. And it it really results from, again, a a pre-scientific conception of where babies come from. But that's why it was viewed as such a heinous thing, just across the board, because it terminated life. And it belongs with other things that prevent life or take life. That's the rationale uh, in the Old Testament. Now, to wrap up here, Again, that, the, both of those were sort of, well, you know, one was kind of a rabbit trail. The, the other one, I think, was more germane to, to Leviticus 18. But to wrap up here, just a couple of things, again, that you can think about how they relate to us. And again, just to sort of recap for interest. I hope you noticed in Leviticus 17 anyway, severe, how punishment, you had a severe punishment for violating rules of sacred space. Uh, this so These sorts of violations of how you worship God were viewed as very serious to the to the point of you know having this karat idea attached to the violation now you know it 's natural for us to see God as more tolerant today, uh, but I think at the very least we could take a hint about examining what it is we do in worship, maybe we could give it more of a God focus and not a worshiper focus because a lot of what happens in church. Uh, you know, again, I'm not saying this is intentional, this is sinister or anything like that. I think it just happens. A, a lot of what happens in church is really focused on the experience of the worshiper, even though the goal is, again, to worship God. I think that's still there. That That's still, you know, in, at least in, in many churches, is still going to be the motivation. But the way things are conducted really focus on the experience of the worshiper as opposed to the object of worship. You know, we, we judge good worship by whether we are bored or not. That that is that's really foreign <laughs> to a biblical mindset. Uh, it wasn't about either being entertained or or even uh, having your your senses excited or wh- however you want to put that. It was really about doing things to show God that we assign importance to Him and not ourselves. That we're 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 thinking about what He wants from us and not what we hope to get out of the sermon. Again, that sort of thing. So I think we can at least take that hint from what's going on in Leviticus here. Secondly, since we are sacred space, and we've talked about this concept before, since we are sacred space, the juxtaposition of these two chapters, think about it, sacred space rules, and then you have sexual boundary rules. I think the juxtap- juxtaposition of those two th- those two concepts is worth noting. This is, again, part of the logic why Paul talks about if you 
he, he links, you know, fornication with sinning against your own body because you're the temple. Again, this is the language from 1 Thessalonians 4, language of 1, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6. Again, there's something going on in Paul's head as to why he links these things. And I think the juxtaposition here of Leviticus 17 and 18 are part of what's floating around in his head. And thirdly, sexual prohibitions should not be viewed as arbitrary. They had a logic to them that was pro-life and pro-family. Again, it, they, sex wasn't exclusively focused on personal personal pleasure or personal convenience. Again, the, the, the pleasure part is going to you know go without saying, and that's not prohibited, again, within the boundaries of, of the biblical family, biblical morality. That's, so that's not divorced from the picture, but, th- but the ultimate focus was on producing life and producing family. So I think, again, in our culture, our, it's basically sort of a sex-crazed culture. We tend to view any prohibition on any pleasure we can experience as totally mean and arbitrary. And then, of course, people beat up the Bible for this. It wasn't. These passages are not written so that space is devoted to being mean. They're written to reinforce a worldview that elevated the production of and care for human life. And I think that's just an important takeaway uh, from these two, these two chapters. Mike, this is such a hot topic in mm-hmm. the Christian community. Um, I'm trying to frame my question and thoughts on this here. In dealing with Leviticus 2013, we're dealing with the actual punishment of homosexuality. In the New Testament, though, I know it's brought up a couple times, a few times, mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily punishable. Right. And so by accepting Jesus, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 do you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but, you know, in the New Testament, you lose the theocratic context and, and you, it, it would depend on, on what the person was exposed to. And I, I even hate to, I even hate to call, you know, like Greek medicine scientific, because if you read Hippocrates, we drift off into the head covering thing again, you know, the, that the woman's hair has something to do with fecundity. They're, they're not science, they're not doing science there, okay? It, it might be better than what it was, but at, at the very least, the theocratic context of this is taken away. And so you don't have uh, really a situation where the community can be governed in in any sort of meaningful or secure way in a, in a theocratic system. And in fact, you know, if you, if you, I, I'm not familiar with Roman law enough to say that, Hey, if a, if a group of Jewish elders, you know, punished a, a homosexual person with death, would, would that have been a violation of Roman law? I don't really know. But in any event, you don't read things like that in the new Testament. And that's actually, I mean, if you really think about it, that's actually a good thing because there's opportunity again for uh, to come to faith, repentance. Yes. You're going to have a struggle with this or that. Everybody has different struggles because, Again, this is me talking. I think that the the New Testament theology about sin is that it does have something to do with residing in the flesh in your body and it, its impulses. This is how sin is talked about. Uh, we all have our own uh, specific impulses that we have to deal with. So you know, even if you know, I'm I'm genetically heterosexual, that's where I, I need to watch my urges. Well, someone homosexual you know, who's a homosexual, I think, can say the same thing. This is in some part genetic. This is in some part what I am in terms of, of my body, my flesh, my makeup, okay? Again, I don't think there's any reason to, to deny that. But just as God can tell me, okay, you're you're this by birth, so control it. Again, I think he has the right to say you're you're that by birth, so control it. You know that that kind of thing. I don't I don't think modern science, in other words, trumps the biblical teaching on these things. Even though from one testament to the other, the logic of them is not presented the same way. Is there any literature outside the Bible of how Christians oh, yeah. treated homosexuals in that time yeah, period? There- there, there is. I think the best thing on this is uh, Robert. His his last name is G A G N O N. He's a professor at uh, somewhere in Pittsburgh. It's either Duquesne or Pittsburgh Seminary. But he's it's a Catholic school, I think. But I don't know if he's Catholic. But a- anyway, um, Gagdon has presented just volumin- a voluminous amount of material on homosexuality in the ancient world, and so. Let me, let me just get the title up here so I don't mistake it because he's got uh, a couple of books. But there's one that's sort of his big introduction to this. The Bible and Homosexual Practice, Texts and Hermeneutics. Um, this book is quite exhaustive 
It is, if I can look at it here real quickly, I have it in my office. It's over 500 pages, and it, it has a lot of background material. Uh, there are other books that deal exclusively like with ancient Near Eastern attitudes and law codes you know, about homosexuality, but within the Christian community across the Testaments, within Judaism and Christianity, Gagnon's book is the one to get. And, and he asserts, and frankly demonstrates, that there is no instance uh, within the, uh, like a practicing Jewish community in the ancient world, uh, there's no instance of, of homosexual relationships being looked upon positively. Again, because they're, they're oriented by the Torah. That's kind of obvious. But he does the same thing with, with the Christian context um, because Christianity grew out of Judaism. So they're linked to the Torah there as well. But again, you have a lot of Gentile involvement. So he goes into the Gentile material again, showing the, the various attitudes and Gentiles were, again, generally uh, tolerant depending on the circumstance uh, of homosexuality, depending on the class, the culture, the, the context in which it occurs, you know, who's the aggressor, who's the, you know, who's the one who's not, uh, all these, all these factors. And, and so the, the early church has to, you know, it, it's going to be including a lot of these people, you know, uh, within uh, it, the believing community who did not grow up thinking like Torah, you know, when it comes to this. And so Gagnon does address, again, how, thinkers and writers and leaders in the early church articulated these sorts of things and, and how they thought about them in light of more so the New Testament, especially Paul, as opposed to necessarily the Old Testament. And how do modern day Jews deal with punishment? It's, it's gonna it's gonna depend on the community. Like Reformed Judaism would be very open, you know, to like homosexual rabbis and homosexual activity. Uh, you're you're more you know your what, what would be called conservative Judaism would have a very negative view of it. Would would refer to it as sin. Uh, I, I hate to you know I, I only know one example of this where I've actually heard uh, someone say it, but uh, Ben Shapiro, who's a talk show host in Seattle, Jewish fellow, conservative. He's not Hasidic, but he's conservative. Uh, I've heard him on a, a number of times just referring to homosexuality as sin. So he would be representative of that wing of Judaism. Certainly, you know, Hasidic community uh, would view it as sin, but it's going to be like the Christian world. You get sort of a, a spectrum of, you know, what the attitudes are and even down to, okay, what about the orientation versus the activity? You know, those, those conversations also go on uh, within a Jewish context as well. Do any of them adhere to Leviticus 2013, where they shall surely be put to death? I mean... No, I don't... It's, it's the same thing, again, because you, you've lost the... Judaism of today is, is in many respects dissimilar to Judaism or you know Israelite practice right. in the Old Testament. Because not only do you not have a temple, you also don't have a secure priesthood uh, to, to make these judgments. You also don't have a theocratic community in any sense. So... While they can look at the Torah and say, look, the Torah condemns this, so don't do it. When it comes to like specific crimes and punishments within the theocratic context, they're, they're, they're just not doing that. I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard an instance in the Jewish community uh, in, in the Western world, and frankly, I've, I've just never heard it, where someone is actually punished today, again, in a modern context that way uh, for homosexuality, although it, it, it's condemned in plenty of, plenty of cases. Yeah, I find that interesting that there's some correlation between the Quran there, where other people take it, you know, the radicals take it yeah. literal. Yeah, and a, and a lot of other Muslims, you know, would would not. It just if you're if you're sort of a Westernized Muslim and you're not, you don't have jihad on the brain, you know, all the time, and and that's not how you define what what the the meaning of the Quran is. And again, and, and those Muslims typically are again very very Westernized. You know, uh, another Muslim might say, well, you're you're a liberal Muslim, or you know, whatever the whatever the term used is. But they're they're Westernized. They know we're not living, you know, in, in the sixth century anymore. Uh, but yet they want to be Muslim. You know, they want to practice, you know, the other principles of Islam that are there that don't involve uh, jihad, uh, you're, you're going to get, a, you know, much more tolerance uh, in, in that respect than you would, you know, a, a radicalized element. Yeah, that's, it's a great topic and a good conversation. I know we need to wrap up, and I know we'll probably touch on this again next week uh, in Chapter 20. So uh, with that, Mike, uh, I want to thank you for doing this. And, uh, and you had some updates about your blogs for 2016. Did you want to oh, yeah. talk about that? Yeah, that Glad, glad you brought that up. Uh, for those um, who maybe only listening to this and didn't didn't look at the blog recently, after December twenty second, maybe maybe even just after Christmas, I'm going to start writing about some things that really are going to attempt to describe uh, what I see as the future or the possible future of 
the, the blog, the podcast, some other things, and really even me uh, as far as being able to produce content for people. Um, I, I don't I don't want to say any more here. I'm gonna I'm gonna flesh those things out, but. I'm just in a situation now where I, I can put it this way. There, there are some things that just have to change uh, for me to be able to produce the kind of content for people that I want to produce. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about what those changes need to be and how they might happen uh, on the blog. So just go up there and you know, visit, you know, subscribe to one of the feeds or whatever your method is, but just stay tuned there. Yeah. And I also want to ask everybody now that we're coming up on Christmas, let's make a big push toward the end of the year to expose as many people as you can. We appreciate all the donations and the Patreon members who give on a monthly basis or a one-time mm-hmm. basis. And uh, we would encourage if you enjoy the content, please contribute uh, so we can keep doing this type of content. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and we just want to thank everybody that has given generously to date and we appreciate it and we hope to can keep doing this for a long long time mm-hmm. it's taken and, and us doing more of it and doing a lot more of it and it's taken yeah. us i'm surprised it's taken us uh, a year to get uh, almost through two two books that is <laughs> uh, yeah. that's yeah uh, Many, many years of content left. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have a long, long, long way to go. And, and not just in terms of the podcast, but there are a number of other things I could be doing uh, to produce content and interact more with, with uh, people in the audience. But um, again, I don't want to get into it here, but I'll be, I'll be blogging about what some of the what the situation is, you know, what some of the problems are, and what some of the solutions might be to be able to do more of this. I guess, Mike, uh, is there anything else that you would like I, to I sh- discuss? I should mention the, uh, the bibliography. The, I, I'm going to be uh, releasing the results of the bibliography work at the end of the year. So we're fast approaching that. And uh, again, stay tuned on the blog for details about that. But we're, we're nearing the end of, of that process. I, I, I can't give a completely coherent guesstimate uh, as to what that's going to look like or, or how it's going to work. But just stay tuned for that, too. And please, if you enjoyed the last couple of shows where we did the interviews, send me some feedback via email, trey.strickland at gmail.com. I'd love to hear any feedback y'all have. I enjoy the emails that I do get about some stories. I had one email um, from somebody, Mike, here. I'm going to bring it up real quick. They were listening to the show, and in one ear, uh, mm-hmm. Leviticus um, 16, 16, the, 16 the, it is. The goat for Azazel, yeah. Yeah, did you see that? they uh, In one ear, they listened to the show, and then a car passed them, and they had a goat in the trailer, and so they were hearing <laughs> goats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my word. So that's, that's great. pretty funny, yeah. So that's <laughs> perfect timing there. All yeah. right, Mike. Well, next week we're going to continue on with Leviticus 19 and 20, correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, good deal. Well, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.